Let me make sure. All right. Everybody- Hello, everyone. Uh, we're back with uh, another episode and a new guest to start off the new year. I don't think we've done one this year yet. No. Um, so uh, we're with Meg Fox Fitness as her handle on Instagram. She's a nutrition, mindset, life coach, all online now, correct? Correct. Uh, Yep. So uh, I'd like to give her the opportunity to introduce herself, tell us exactly what she does, and then uh, why we thought it would be awesome to have her on today. Amazing. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm honored to be one of your first uh, episodes of 2024. What a way to kick it off. You guys are amazing. Um, I've been following these two legends for a bit now, and uh, I'm really honored and excited She's to be here. Good. So thank yeah. you. We have her on every week. She's smart. Yeah. Uh, my name is Meg Fox. I grew up in Malden, Massachusetts, right north of the city. Um, I now live in Salem, Mass. I am. I come from a background, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in, in depth in a bit. I come from a background of you know sports, athletes. Uh, athletics. I was a Patriots cheerleader. I was in the dance world for a long time. Um, But I'm now a fat loss and mindset nutrition transformation coach. So um, as again, we'll talk about in depth, I'm really big on the mindset piece when it comes to fitness and nutrition, because that is kind of the biggest piece to the puzzle. So I'm really excited to kind of dive in uh, with all the things today. So let's let's get to it. Yeah, so we wanted um, I saw her episode with um anthony's beyond podcast that we were on a few weeks ago and i found the nutrition conversation really interesting and your background really interesting and we talk a lot about the mental health uh i've experienced depression uh we've had you know difficult times in the house and difficult situations and i thought um it was really interesting the more i learned about depression and how much food can impact that and one of the leading causes of depression is poor gut health and um for fitness and health in general. Um, so I thought talking to you would be extremely beneficial to people that listen to us on mental health for also that other nutrition aspect. As I'm sure you know that a lot of people who are looking to get into physical fitness also have uh, mental fitness issues. Yeah, 100%. It really does all go hand in hand. And it's unbelievable when people are eating well and moving their body how many, you know, not all, but most problems are solved. Um, So it is crazy with all the food that's out there. Like you walk through some of the grocery stores sometimes and you're like, how is this even able to be sold in the United States? Or why are people not given the knowledge that they need um, to be eating properly? A lot of people just have no idea and it's not their fault. Like, unfortunately, we grow up in a place where you see all these things in the grocery store. And unless you get to a point where you're willing to do the research, then you're kind of in put in a really bad spot. So, you know, you see a lot of people my age and beyond, I'm 38, where people are just having to learn for the first time, like, what is real food and what's not and how it affects your day to day mood, your happiness, your depression, your mindset, all the things. Um, so it's kind of, um, infuriating that it's not taught more in schools and, and growing up, like that should be one of, you know, the most important topics that's taught in most schools, in my opinion. Yeah, I get frustrated with it, but go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I get frustrated with it. I always, cause I've had to self-educate on myself on all, uh, everything, nutrition and almost you have to go out of your way to find good websites or good sources or good people to talk to about it. And uh, as I got older, I was frustrated that maybe I didn't learn it at a younger age, but. Yeah. I think the lifestyle that everyone, it seems like the rat race is just keeps getting tougher and tougher with all these time frames for little kids with sports. So it affects families, households. No one sits down to eat together. So you can't even make a meal. People are just making four, four different meals for the people in the house. So, I really appreciate what you do. And I, I guess one of my questions is how you tie in dealing with the different age groups that you train or you advise or you try to educate, how you adjust your conversations to those different groups. Because we actually have talked to, um, you know, life coaches. I, I actually have a customer of mine who's a life coach and then someone else is a life coach and um, found you really interesting because you're not just having conversation, you're getting them up to doing things, tying the mind and body together. 
Yeah. So I think, I think an important thing with my job and unfortunately I don't get to work with everybody one-on-one. -on -one. It just kind of depends. I, what program people sign up for, um, whether they just sign up, they want to do something on their own or whether we're working closely together. But when I get that opportunity, which again, I wish I could do that with everybody. It's I meet people where they're at and try to make realistic, um, healthy changes that are going to really benefit their lifestyle that's realistic to follow. Because a, a lot of times you see these unrealistic, um, crazy things that, like you said, like are just not going to fit into the rat race of people's day to day. It's I agree with you in the fact that it's out of control with people have no time to do anything, which is is sad. It's not the way that it's supposed to be. But unfortunately, that's how it is for many. Um, and we're a little lazy by nature, too, where we take the easy way out, whether it's the fast food or I mean, it takes real effort to eat correctly. And I watched Quentin do it as at his age with his responsibilities and so on. And I guess if we develop those habits young, like when you have young people, do you find that they're more open to get on track than older people that are maybe set in their ways a little? Yeah, I, again, kind of reaching on that point. I think if if we, you know, I deal with a lot of people, and I mean this in the best way possible, who have tried several diets and fad diets, and they've been conditioned for so long to be like that all in all out mentality. And that's really hard to break. So that is kind of my expertise is that I'm able to do that for people and let them know like it doesn't have to be like some horrific experience where it feels miserable. Um, it actually can be, it's just as easy. It's kind of just breaking that limiting belief. People like to convince themselves it's really hard to move or to eat well. It's like, because they're so comfortable doing what they've been doing. So they need to convince themselves that that's too hard and that's too expensive and X, Y, Z. When in reality, it's actually just as easy to flip over to the other side, but it's breaking that kind of comfort zone that a lot of people. I'd have uh, to skip yeah. going out to eat one day. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask you, um, we cross a lot of different paths where his friends are a lot older and my friends are on the younger side of it. And um, some, of, some of his friends are into the nutrition at his age and then some of them aren't. And same with my friends. Some of them are into it. Some of them aren't. But I wanted to ask you how, when someone comes to you and they 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 live uh, an unhealthy lifestyle, they're not super into it, and they come to you and say, "All right, I want to fix it. I want to get on track." What are the first steps to cleaning that up? Uh, like, what would you tell someone when they're first trying to get into it? What's the easiest way to to clean up right away? What do you get rid of? What do you put in? How do you do? It? That's a good question. So, somebody who's like starting like fresh, starting fresh. Yep, no, doesn't know anything about nutrition. Doesn't isn't well read on it to start and fresh. Right. So my first step, just to kind of, even when people join my six week challenge, um, I say, start with the basics. Like don't get into macros and calories straight out the gates. Like let's just think about food choices. So really just trying to stick with whole foods most of the time. And basically what that means for somebody who doesn't even know what that means, which I understand why you wouldn't because it's not talked about often. Basically, whole foods are foods as close to their natural state as possible, aka haven't been tampered with, don't have a huge list of ingredients. So think of like the outskirts, outskirts, that's what I'm looking for, outside aisles of the grocery store. That's where you want to buy most of your stuff. Think lean meats, eggs, fruits, vegetables, salads. Of course, you're going to go down the middle aisles at some point, but you don't, most of that stuff you don't need. You're going to, you're going to stock up on the outside aisles for the most part. Um, so you really want to ditch things like pop tarts. Like I always use the example of special K bars. When I grew up, those were huge. Do you remember? Like I don't know if you remember. You might be. I too remember old. pop tarts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pop tarts were good. Those still were happened all five times during this conversation. Yeah, and you all know some of my examples. <laughs> I know. I might though. So <laughs> special K bars. Um, I used to eat all the time. We grew up with them in my household. They had strawberry, blueberry. That's what I remember. And they tasted so artificial. Like there was probably nothing even remotely close to an actual blueberry in there. And God knows what else was in there. Um, so an example I like to give my clients is let's ditch stuff like that and replace it with maybe like a handful of almonds and some actual blueberries. So it's food that your body is meant to consume. So like you think back to like the hunter gatherer days and like things that actually grow on trees from the ground, like things that you're meant to consume. Like we're not meant to consume 
chemicals and all these things that are made in factories. And that's why people are coming up with, you know, illness and not feeling themselves because it's not meant to be ingested. And unfortunately, like America is just filled with all of that junk, which is unfortunate. But like you said, if you do the research and just try to make that attempt and cleaning it up, even if it's a 90 10 rule, I always do a 90 10. Like you can't, you can't go all in on that stuff because it's hard here. So you got to still leave room and not obsess because that can be a slippery slope too. So it's like, you got to do your best, but also, you know, just try to live your life without having it consume you. Yeah. Uh, that, that was awesome. Cause this is, you probably, I talk about that every day with what's our phrase. If it doesn't run, swim or grow, we don't, we try not to touch it. Um, and we heard that from a nutritionist. Oh, that must be six, seven oh, years yeah. ago. It's funny the things you remember. She was the Bruins yeah. nutritionist, Julie. I can't remember Julie's last name. She was very good and spoke simply. Yeah. Um, but yeah. We so I, yeah, I heard that six years ago when I was in high school. And I still remember that phrase. And I talk about it all the time. And I've gotten super into fitness. And um, I've made some big changes to my body in the gym with lifting. And people ask all the time, you know, like, oh, like, what do you do? What do you do? I'm like, it's just, it was, it was all food for me. And then they asked, Oh, well, what do you eat? And I'm like, I try to stick to whole foods and don't stray too far from that. But once in a while you have to break it. So my next question would be, how do you tell or help people find the balance between, all right, you know, maybe a cheap meal here and there, maybe you, you know, you're in a pinch and you haven't eaten in eight hours. Maybe McDonald's is your only option on the road. How do you help people find that balance between bad, good, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so funny thing is when I talk about food, I actually don't like to label food good or bad. Because I just feel like that gives people a poor relationship with food. And I know so many people who I work with kind of, you know, a lot of people are coming from different ends of the spectrum where they have looked at food, you know, labeled as bad their whole life. And, you know, they're trying to break that cycle or that's all they want. And it becomes like an unhealthy, you know, addiction in all the things. Um, so I like to call it like treats, not a cheat treats. So when I use my 90, 10 rule, so basically just to get into it, cause now we're going to get into it. I'm, I'm kind of getting more in depth than I was planning on with this question, but here we go. So when I give my clients, you know, a food plan or food guidance, we base it off of, and again, this is strictly a guide. It doesn't always work this way every day, three meals and two snacks. So you're looking at like five mini meals, whatever you want to look at it, call it and uh 90, 10 look at it how you want, but I think eat well 90% of the time. And then you have a 10, you know, the other 10 window to eat your treats to break that down a little further. I had a, a client who was an accountant and she's like, 90, 10 is too bad for me. I, I need like, I need more information. So she's like, based off the 90, 10 rule, that's, you know, three or four treats a week. And again, however you want to view that. So like, if you go out and you want pizza, like have a slice of pizza and a huge salad. Like it's really just however each person wants to view it. Like, for example, like if I eat super clean most of the day, which I do, then like I'm not even going to bat an eyelid if I want, you know, a piece of a dark chocolate bar and a glass of red wine. Like I probably wouldn't even consider that. That would just be in my clean eating regimen, going to be honest with you. Uh, but it's it's kind of how everybody wants to look at it with kind of keeping it, you know, keeping it on the on the rails. Even half the food. So I... I shop that way at my grocery store, but not because I'm educated on it, but because I'm in and out in 10 minutes, but I only get necessities. So I very rarely, not that I'm not guilty of it, but drift into the other aisles too much. Yeah, so I'm, great. I'm the fastest uh, grocery shopper there is in Massachusetts, I think. Get but, in and get but, out. I don't blame mm -hmm. you. But with all the changes like in foods and, you know, one of the things I like is you're kind of in between Quentin and I age ones. You know, mm -hmm. as far as your life experience with foods and what you grew up with, and now you're making decisions for yourself, what she's doing. Um, you know, so we we were always out running around getting that exercise that now seems to be organized and set up in time frames. And you offer that uh, program to people, which is really good. So I always used to tell the kids I coached, my age group, our stamina was 10 times better. Because that's all we did was run around. Right. Quentin's age group, they look 10 times better than we did. We were all skinny and they're much stronger and so on. But at the lifestyle thing, I find it interesting because if you're if you have a 20-year-old person that's taking one of your programs 
and they're in classes, right? They're not all individualized. Eat, like you offer these classes and they tell us how that works. Like how you do your online, do they sign right. up for classes or groups? Or? So it's not really classes. So people could either buy a program where they're, they're following a structured program that's already built out, or they could work one-on-one -on -one with me where it's more customized. So if they're feeling like they want something custom to them, then that, that would be a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's not like you sign on and attend a class. It's it's programmed within the app and they do it that way. And then the one-on-one -on -one we do, you know, weekly meetings, we chat on the app um, where we, we make sure everything's kind of going to plan and I make program adjustments and things like that. Um, yeah. But back to the, to circle back to the nutrition piece real quick, I this just kind of popped in my head and I wanted to share it. It's funny because I feel like when I first really got into the food piece of it, it was because I was so much younger and I was doing it for the physical result. So I started to learn that you can't, obviously, now that I'm older, I'm doing it to be healthy. And I'm glad that I had that mindset shift. Um, but the majority of people's fitness results is going to come from the food. And I think that that's, per that's really important for people to understand because you have these people beating themselves up in the gym. But if you're not eating the right way, you're just not going to see the result. So like, I like to share this example, not to say don't work out, but to share how important the nutrition piece is. If you have two people, one's working out around the clock and not paying attention to the food, what they're eating, they're eating whatever they want, junk, processed foods. And then you have someone over here not working out at all and eating really clean, like foods that are meant to be ingested. The person who's not working out at all is going to appear and be much healthier. Yeah, makes sense. And and their results are going to come tenfold. So that's, I don't share this example to say, don't work out. I share that example to say how important the nutrition piece is. And when you pair the two together, that's when you really see like the ultimate success. Yeah. Even, even me, I, uh, cause I know as I get older, my legs are also getting older or my joints are getting older and I have to eat. I can't eat half as much portions, smaller and so on just for maintenance purposes. Whereas, Quentin does different programs to gain weight or, you know, the way that he wants to deal with it. Me, I'm just trying to keep my weight down so my knees aren't yelling at me and and joints and so on. That's what I mean about how you must adjust to different age groups with programs. Right. Yeah, it's super interesting, like having a, a mixed age group. I really enjoy kind of all of them. So it's it's really fun. I, I really yeah. love it. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, at my age and in the social media world, the there's a big phrase, the body positivity conversation is always around. It's always around gyms, schools, uh, pretty much everywhere. And um, I think it, it's a really interesting um, kind of broad topic that I think it is very important that everybody loves themselves and everybody is is happy with the whoever they are and appreciates what they have. And no matter where you're at, you should love yourself. But I think people use that body positivity term as an excuse to not be healthy and I think that's where the flaw in the broadness of the term comes so I want to ask you how you find the balance with people or how you uh, work with people to find the balance between okay yes love yourself wherever you're at you should love your body but also we have a couple things that obviously you want to be healthier and maybe lose weight to be healthier and how you go about that with people and maybe how comfortable people are talking about that with you. This is a really good question. This is a good one. Whew. This is a, this is a, a heavy one. No, this is good. Um, it's a very fine line and it's social media is a very amazing yet scary place in a lot of ways. Um, I feel very happy that I didn't grow up with social media being as aggressive as it, as it is now in terms of, you know, people having their face in the phone 24 seven. Um, so I think it is tough that people are always seeing, you know, be pre being presented something that might not be accurate or real or um, feel unattainable. I think it puts a lot of added stress on people that is not needed because we already have enough stress in our daily life. Um, I'm going to make sure that I, I hit on your question without varying too far off. Um, in terms of my clients, obviously, I people come to me because they want to, you know, find a healthy lifestyle or have, an, have abs, have a bigger butt, have a loser, uh, a, a smaller butt. 
So I'm, that's part of my job, but I am very clear with all of them. It's okay to have those type of goals. It's fun to have those type of goals, but you have to love your body at every phase of the journey and respect it for what it does for you every single day. Um, to your point, where's that line of, um, with people in general, not necessarily like clients, where is that line between like, love yourself, but also like, you don't want to be like self love to the point that you're just like neglecting your health and being a really unhealthy version of yourself. So I would say a good rule of thumb is to just prioritize your health and movement. And whatever that looks like for you physically, love that embrace it and appreciate your assets or your body or whatever your body makes you that your body makes you you. So I would say as long as you're prioritizing your health, then it's really important to just like understand that that's kind of what we need to be doing. Yeah. Um, Do you have a lot of people because so again, I listen to other people's podcasts and um, on the whole idea of loving who you are, not loving trying to be someone else. Right. And this whole um, the podcast, one thing I was listening to was about, almost this uh, reality show thing. I want to look like that person. and But that might not be the skill set and the gifts that your body has. I mean, how do you, you almost have to bring someone back a little bit to reality and say, you, you know, like the phrase you guys use, to be the best version of yourself, but don't try to be someone that you're not. And I would think that's exactly. really hard in your business at times. Yeah, I mean, and even my own self, I've gone through that. I mean, I've been a professional dancer. I been through several auditions and I've got in shut down for because I wasn't X, you know, my legs weren't long or I wasn't X height. So it's like I've had to deal with that. But it's kind of just like you have to love your body for what it is. Like I'm never going to be tall. Like I'm short and curvy. And like that bothered me at one point when I was younger. But I taught myself and embraced it and learn to love it. And that's one thing that I kind of try to teach my clients is like, when you're like getting in the shower, instead of being so mean to yourself, which so many people are like, Oh, my God, I'm gross, or I'm don't look this way yet. And it's like, just look at yourself and be like, Oh, my God, I'm so strong. Look at the workouts that I just completed. Like, I'm so grateful that I have these curves or I my body looks this way, like that makes me me. And so I think it's really important just to like lean in and own what makes each individual us. Cause there's only one of you, yeah. there's one of you, there's one of me. And again, you can work out and eat healthy and try to look X, Y, Z, but at the end of the day, like just enjoy the process and do it to be healthy, but just love your body at every phase. And the results I always tell my clients too, that the more the, the talk up in your brain becomes you switch it from negative to positive the physical results come 10 times faster too for people who are looking to achieve X, Y, Z. It's all up in here. If you yeah. hold on to these negative things and these self-hate, like I I swear, it almost halts everybody's progress when they are trying to lose the weight or gain the weight or whatever the case may be. But the second they're able to kind of make that shift and it's a skill, you got to catch yourself with the negative self-talk, flip it. Even if you don't believe it at first, the more you keep saying it to yourself, you eventually will. I swear the, the physical results follow 10 times faster. Yeah, Quentin uh, brought up something good. I, I know we wanted to ask you about, you just made me think of it, um, trying out for the the cheerleader experience and how you mentally were strong enough to get over your fears or lack of confidence. Yeah, I want. I just wanted you to tell the story. I listened to you tell it uh, with Anthony about how uh, you got there and you didn't know if it was for you and I just want I'll let you tell the story but I wanted to listen sure. to you tell that because I thought it had a great message in it thank you yeah this is a great story I love this one so I was 18 years old I was a senior in high school at Arlington Catholic High School um I had been in the dance world for a long time um and a bunch of people had mentioned to me the Patriot cheerleader audition is coming up like you should definitely go and I'm like okay like cool. Yeah, I'll go. I'll try it. I knew I needed a headshot. I need to get my outfits ready. Um, I was prepared as you could possibly be in terms of like the dance side of things. Like I lived and breathed in the day. Like I lived, the dance studio was my second home. So I'm like, okay, yeah, cool. I'll go. Didn't really overthink it. Just got my stuff together and did it. My mother drives me to Gillette Stadium 
um, she took the day off of work and we roll up. Now, again, I'm 18 years old. You had to be 18 to audition. I'm a quote unquote baby, or I felt I was at that time. So we pulled up and there's all what I thought looked like, you know, mature women. They looked and seemed so much older than me and so much more mature. Like from my perspective, that's what I saw. And I looked at my mother and I was like, I'm not going in. And she's like, what? She's like, you have to go in. I just took the day off the work. I drove all the way up here. And I'm like, I'm not going in. I'm freaking out. I don't belong here. Like, I'm not going in. And she's like, Meg, you have to go in. So I'm like, okay, fine. Like, I wasn't happy about it. I think I was on the verge of tears, if not already crying. I go into the stadium, um, end up making, there was like several cuts that day. I got through every single one, ended up making the team. Um, weeks later, I found out because it was a, it was a long process. And it was just, I still use that experience uh, all the time to remind myself, like, if you don't put yourself out of your comfort zone, you never know what you can achieve. And I almost did walk away at that moment because I was scared. Um, so no, nothing good comes from comfort, right? Um, and I also like to share too, like, there's been moments that I have auditioned for things or put myself in uncomfortable situations that maybe didn't end my way as well. But that also prepared me, you know, for positive things in life, too. So it doesn't mean to say like, step out of your comfort zone, you're always going to get something great, but nothing bad comes from stepping out of your comfort zone, whether it's a lesson or something that's preparing you for the next opportunity. Um, so that's really just the, the message. It's, it's a great message because I know from studying kids, you know, trying out for teams for 45 years coaching and how hard that is. And we had a lot of empathy for the kids that got cut, especially yeah. as you get older and you realize more of looking at it from two sides, but that you weren't, and your mom made sure you work on your fear of failure was not going to win. Mm -hmm. And we talk about snowplow parents now all the time, you know, they want to clear the path, but to your mom's credit, she made you go through it. And I'm sure that's given you a lot of strength when you've been approached by other situations that were difficult. Yeah, it really was. That that, that message stands by me uh, often in life. And uh, it's so funny because me and one girl inside the audition became very close. There was eight hundred over 800 girls there at that time. This was like the glory days when they were like unbelievable. Oh, four, oh, six. Everyone wanted to be uh, part of it. Yeah, they were great. And then it's funny because when we were leaving the audition, now they're out of all those people, me and this girl gravitated towards each other. We leave the audition and my mom is hanging out with another lady in the parking lot and it was her mother. And we're still like best friends to this day. So it's just like such a cool story. Good instincts. Yeah, I thought the message of that you ended up getting through it and then you said in Andy's podcast that it ended up being maybe the best two years of your life looking back on it, but it would have been two years that you didn't have if you didn't. Uh, push through it. And I thought that was a great message of we talk about doing stuff that you don't want to do yeah. Uh, yeah, all the time and how like get something like getting in an ice bath or cold showers can just doing something that you don't want to do can make you stronger and uh, improve your mental well-being. Yeah, we, we were just talking earlier today about how my age group, the coaches were all, they all had toxic masculinity. You know, those that, that's the phrase they use now. But it taught us that lesson that you just that you just talked about, and now I don't know if those lessons are as easy to find, right? Um, because everyone can find the team they can make. You know, it might be this C or D team; it doesn't matter. And um, I th I thought, and Quentin brought that up about your experience with eight hundred people competing for a short number of uh, spots. I think that's an awesome story because I know. Quentin's gone through tryouts as have I as a young person and then coaching. It's a really interesting opportunity to learn more about yourself. 100%. Good stuff. Yeah. So I was talking about uh, Dr. Dan O'Neill, who's an orthopedic surgeon up in New Hampshire. And then he went back to school to become a psychologist. And he talks about mind and body working together all the time. And his one of his interesting things in his book, Spark, and he also has another book, Survival of the Fit. It's all about kids in schools. And a lot of private schools now are doing exercises to start the day. And then Quentin told me in China they do it to get the endorphins going and the body going and so on. Like, I found it interesting because we had just watched you. And I said, that's somewhere that you should be in schools. 
They, oh. should, they should use something from what you do in schools, maybe to get the day going and so on. And it's every single study supports it. 100%. 100%. Back to what we were saying, like there's a lot of things that could be adjusted in the school system that I think would really benefit not even just a school system, even in jobs where people are sat at desks all day, every day. Like, yeah, remember, job places started putting gyms in the buildings and mm -hmm. insurance discounts if you went to a gym. So they, they're kind of ahead of the schools. 100%. Even today, like I work from home most days now and I'm doing a lot of programming, which is on the computer. And so you have to be aware, like your, even just your step count. Workouts aside, like how much are you getting up and just walking and moving and getting fresh air? So today, I think literally my steps were at embarrassingly enough from being at the computer all day. I think it was literally like 400 steps. And I just took my coffee and just it didn't it, you don't even have to call it a workout. Just go out for walks. And I uh, brought my steps from like 500 to like probably past 7000 just by like going, you know, around the block to Dunkin Donuts, got my coffee. Like it's just hit the road more and just get out and move when you need a little bit of a break. And it helps with everything mentally. It helps me. It helps me focus. Um, and again, just moving like we we're not meant to be sedentary at a desk all day, every day. Yeah. There's a the huge shift to online. Like I do online classes uh, this year cause I'm not playing basketball. So I didn't uh, feel the need to be at school physically. And uh, you can get roped in to sitting on the computer. And I think it's probably another reason that people are, getting away from being physically fit so much because you almost feel you get so comfortable just sitting all day that when it is finally the work day's over, the school day's over, when it's time to get up and move around, you don't, you don't want to at all. You want to just throw on a movie and stay where it's warm. And I, I want to ask like, how do you, so many people ask about motivation and what, what motivates you to get up and go to the gym? What motivates you to get up and go to a walk and go for a walk? But after a couple of weeks of, eating healthy and working out that motivation that maybe you had to start in the gym goes away. So how do you have people stay disciplined and stay in the gym and stay eating healthy? And what do you, would you recommend to those people who maybe after a couple of weeks, the motivation's gone and they don't see the results they might like and the motivation goes away? Yeah. So I would say first and foremost, the first part of that question, um, I think when people are able to view their health and fitness from like an internal perspective and doing it for health reasons, people who view health that way are more likely to see and stick to something long term. Whereas people who are more looking for like, I want to look good, and there's nothing wrong with this. I want to look good for the wedding or wedding, or I want to look good for this event. And they're strictly going off like the scale. It's like, it's not a big enough reason. Because some days we care about what we look like. Some days we don't. Some days we care about what the scale says. Some days we don't. Some days we want to be on the couch with ice cream. Some days we care about looking a certain way. It's like, you gotta, you gotta focus, dig down deep and find the bigger reason, the bigger why to why you want to do this journey in the first place. Cause that's the only thing that's going to kind of keep you on track. Um, and same thing, like when people sign up for my challenges and whatnot, it's funny because you'll have people who go super gung ho the first two weeks. And I'm like, you gotta tap into that mindset piece because it's not always going to feel exciting. You know, like I look at health and fitness, like especially as we get older, it needs to be just as important as any other task you have in your life, whether it's a, a work meeting or something as, as dumb as like when it comes to taking care of yourself, like brushing your teeth. People aren't skipping that. You know what I mean? Granted, it takes way less effort in, you know, a minute. Um, but moving your body and feeding your body the food that it's supposed to eat is literally just as important, if not the most important thing that we do every single day. So I think yeah. just that's a complete mindset shift that needs to be made and kind of taking it off just like the vanity again, nothing wrong with it. Like the vanity wanting to look a certain way and it needs to be like, I'm going to do this for my internal health, give my body this fuel so I can have energy and live a long life. And then the physical results follow. And then it's always, you're so right because even as you get older, you know, um, your health kind of surprises you sometimes you don't realize you're aging and so on. And I think if you develop those habits at a younger age, you have a better chance of not only being in a better place at 45, 55, and so on, but also being able to live a productive life with a, um, we used to always use this word with uh, Quentin's mom when she got sick, the quality of life. Right. You know, that you have that and 
uh, define it in a good way. But I wanted to ask you, as someone that you really got into this full steam, and I uh, I did find it interesting that you've been doing this since 2013. And when I heard you say that, you're ahead of a lot of people on this. Um, and it, it, it kind of brings up like this whole, so you said, I think you went to um, down to Lauderdale for a couple of years. Yep. Is that right? Yes. Um, see, I, I have my Lake Worth shirt on today. Love it. But, um, and that lifestyle, you know, I when I'm down there, I see people at the beach all the time. It's a much easier to go outside there to work out at 6 a.m. with the sun coming up in Del Rey than it is outside our doors. So sure. what made you, and I'm sure you had your social years to different degrees and so on. If you're living in those environments, it's challenging. I think you said you worked in restaurants or did waited on tables and so on. Mm -hmm. When was it that you really decided that I think this is a future for me? This is something that I can have as a job and I'm really, I'm really going to commit to this. We all keep in shape when we're young and, you know, I was always in sports and, but then we see a lot of our friends kind of disappear from that world and they don't want to do it anymore. So what, right. what kind of kept, got you on that track for a lifetime? That's a good question. So this, I'm going to probably tap into the limiting beliefs here for a second when it comes to the business stuff, but that's kind of on the same realm, but bear with me. Yep. So when I moved to Fort Lauderdale in 2013, I had just kind of hung up the dance shoes, whether at that time, I didn't know if it was temporarily, I didn't know if it was a hiatus, I didn't know if it was forever. I didn't know. I just knew the dance stuff was at a halt and I was moving on land because I had been performing on ships for a long time, post Patriot cheerleader stuff. So I was in Fort Lauderdale and um, I kind of just went down there on a whim. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of figure things out. I had never thought past oddly enough, past my dance career, because that's what I worked for my whole life. And then I felt like I was starting over at, how old would I have been then? 20, I think I was 26, 27, when I moved to Fort Lauderdale, would that be right? Yeah, that would be right. Um, And so I just got a job, obviously, to make money. I was working in the, the bars, cocktail waitress, working at restaurants, hustling, hustling, hustling. And of course, the fitness thing never left. I was still doing it all the time, trying to find a new way of staying in shape that made me feel healthy, but also felt like empowering and not boring. Because prior to that, I was mainly doing my shows, my dancing, my passion. That's what kept me in shape. So I'm like, I need to find ways that feel good, make me feel like a badass, that are effective to kind of take to replace the passion that I was used to having on a day to day basis. Um, so that's when I really got into kind of um, the strength training side of things and like experimenting with like hit workouts and kind of just like what felt good for my body and that I felt worked well. Um, and it kind of started out as like, even though I had been into fitness prior to that, obviously with the dance stuff, it kind of started out as like a hobby, but I was really good at it. And I never thought of it, about it being a business strictly because my brain just never went there because I, I didn't go to school for business. And like, that's how we just thought. Like, I didn't even, I never would have thought as myself as someone who could run a business because that's not a place that my brain went just because I was focused on my dance stuff. Um, so it was such a passion. Again, started as a hobby at an Instagram account. I would just post stuff for fun. Like, here's my smoothie. Like, again, just more for me, just trying to do it for myself and have fun with it. And then uh, I was like, wait, maybe I could do this. It's like a little side hustle, you know? And uh, I got business cards made. I was like networking and I um, started training like tons of people and going to to home gyms and, and all the things. So it kind of just stemmed from that. And it's pivoted a bunch of times since then. Obviously, now I'm strictly online with an app. But um, that's kind of where it came from. But it, it I'm not going to lie, like it took years for me to kind of feel like I can do this, like I can run a business. And I remember one day thinking like, who am I to do this? Like, I don't know anything about business. And for, with the limiting belief thing, I almost threw in the towel because I didn't think I had the right or the knowledge or the capability to do but something like nice that. there's a nice humility to that. Yeah. That you're you're going to question to reinforce whether you're doing the right thing. Right. So it was literally, I remember this exact moment. I was like, I could either sit here and say, I can't do this, or I can say I can do it. And then I'm forcing myself to take the steps that I need to take to learn how to do the business side of things and all of that. And it kind of yeah. just 
It's a decision. I have yeah, two I want decisions. you around Quentin. Yeah. No, because he's, yeah. he's feeling that a little bit now. Yeah. And I think he probably listened to you and he go that was yeah. reinforcement. That's exactly what I was sorry about to say. Um, on a lesser or different level of I spent my whole life trying to make it to play college basketball and it ended up being uh, Division three because uh, my father didn't give me fantastic athletic abilities and um, I wasn't I gifted. Yeah, I no can't. Ups. I don't get up that well, but I I worked really hard to to go play in college and I really wanted to play in college and that's that was my thing. Like your thing was dance and for you it was the end of the career and then you had to find something else. And me, my uh, knee injury, uh, I had it. I knew I was going to at least miss a year and I was like, all right, I, I need to find something else to do and something that I really like. And for me, I've really gotten into, um, well, everything physical, but I've gotten into the bodybuilding style of lifting, of trying to see, uh, you know, how big I can get certain things to look. And then I've gotten super into doing cold tub stuff and then in the sauna and uh, super into my fitness. So it's cool to hear that uh, a similar story that took you on that path. And for me, one of the big challenges for me of fully diving into the fitness world and in the college lifestyle it was hard, but it was getting rid of certain people around me who were maybe taking me away from those goals. And I'm sure it's hard for a lot of people who are trying to get into fitness and nutrition of uh, maybe your parents have brownies on the table or cookies on the table and you can't be eating that stuff. So it's, I think for me, one of the biggest things was surrounding myself with people uh, who were like-minded in their goals, it really helped me. And I was wondering if you had anybody around you like that that maybe pushed you closer towards doing that. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think you can probably relate. There, I'm surrounded by a lot of people, and I there's a lot of, like, closed-mindedness, and then there's a lot of people who are really open-minded and think anything is possible, and then you have people who don't think it is, and they're kind of, like, stuck in their ways. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to ditch those people because they were just, you know, they're. I'm a ditcher. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to ditch them, but like. I have, we, I, give, we give them a test. Yeah, I, yeah. I ditch them. <laughs> but as, long as, as long as you have a, a group or a network or even a few buddies by your side or family that know that X, Y, Z, and the, you can achieve anything you want, that's really important. Yeah, well, right. I have a lot of respect for what you did because you go off on your own. I mean, obviously, I don't know a lot about it, but I I see you down there. I know that, you know, I've seen a million people in their 20s down there with dreams and so on. You get in that nice area, the warm sun, and that you found a niche that makes you happy. It probably makes you feel good about yourself. More can You do what you do with more conviction. I think that's really that's really commendable. I think that's awesome. And, um, you know, we, we kid about it on the ditching thing, but <laughs> Quentin has now circled back, which I have done too, circled back to people that he knew before, but, you know, we're always learning and changing. And, and now he's finding those people, other people that are his group. Mm -hmm. And we only need a few. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's, it's nice to see. Yeah, it's always changing, too. Like, you guys should be really proud of yourselves, too. Like, I told you, I think I already touched on this at the beginning. Like, when I first got introduced to your page and your podcast, like, I ended up going down a rabbit hole of all the videos, and I was just so into it. And your whole story is just so great and so cool. And it takes guts to do something, you know, that you guys are doing and put yourself out there and tell your story and um, bring other people on. Like, that's a big deal. And I know you impacted me, and I know you're impacting you know, many others and going to continue to impact more. So, well, it sounded like for me, it's almost um, making up for mistakes in some ways. You know, you do things, you, you evaluate them and you uh, reflect back. And I did things a lot wrong. This is something that I can uh, help other people not make the mistakes I made. And mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's fun to do something with Quentin and listening to his view. And, you know, as a father son, sometimes we don't like listening to each other at times. Exactly. But uh, we we find it easier to circle back, and uh, you know, then have a discussion of hopefully with growth in it. So right. while it's advancing, because so many people my age just get stuck and stagnant in that life, you know, right. without any craft warnings or, and um, 
you know, we didn't have that, which I'm grateful for. We learned a lot from our experience, but we learned from you and um, the way you present something. I'm sure tomorrow when I'm at work, because I have a painting coming, I can, I can listen to stuff all day. It can be a little much. And uh, I'll reflect back on some of the things you say, and I'll take some of that, and I'll learn from it, which I really appreciate from you. Oh, yeah, you guys are you guys are a great team. I'm going to do great things. I, I feel it. Yeah, I was excited to have you on because um, I've lived the uh, unhealthy way and now the healthy way, and I try to tell people how much better the healthy way is. But you, it's hard to really explain it until you do it. And um, I was listening to you. I liked uh, – on your reels or quotes or whatever, the simplicity in some of the lines of getting started and stuff, I thought it was put uh, really simple. And I thought the people that listen to us would really like um, seeing your page and connecting with you as well. So I thought it would uh, be really good. And I appreciate you for coming on. I think it was an uh, awesome conversation. Oh my God, it was amazing. And I'm excited to see what you guys do in the future. And we got to stay in touch. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Likewise, it'll be fun to watch you grow and, um, since you already have some good history in your growth, it'll be fun to see how you continue. Thank yeah. you. I'm excited. Thank you very much. I'm going to 